What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Okay, so getting back into X-Men Red, I want to kind of sidetrack here for a second, and the reason why is because I was looking through the comments for the first X-Men Red video, and there were some of you guys who were still a little bit confused about the nature of Cassandra Nova. And that makes sense, because really, unless you read Grant Morrison's new X-Men, she's pretty obscure. So the way this works is Cassandra Nova originally appeared in E is for Extinction, which was the first three issues, 114 through 117, of Grant Morrison's run. Her origin wasn't fully explained. Uh, that didn't come until new X-Men number 125. But she had taken the son of Bolivar Trask, uh, who had access to these wild sentinels, these sentinels that were initially experiments uh, and nothing was ever really done with them. But because they were based on voice recognition, the son of Bolivar Trask or, or grandson or something like that, nephew, I can't remember, was the only one who was able to access them. And so she basically took him to that location, used him to access the sentinels and then killed him. And then when that happened, she sent those sentinels to Genosha, which was kind of like a mutant haven and then massacred 16 million of them. And that explains why Genosha has really been like abandoned and destroyed ever since. Of course, this is a story that was written back in 2001. Following that, questions reigned as to what the origin of Cassandra Nova was, what her intention was, all that kind of good stuff. And so fast forward to Uncanny X-Men 120, or I'm sorry, New X-Men 125, <laughs> and you end up finding out she's what's called a Mumradi. Now, the way this works is, is it, it was Grant Morrison kind of using basically metaphorical storytelling because he does, uh, which is dumb. And what he essentially said is that inside every person is like their evil counterpart. You know, we have like a good and evil to ourselves, a yin and a yang, that when every single human being is, you know, comes into existence, which is to say, like, in the early stages of their development, as we develop, there will be an evil counterpart to ourselves. And the kind of person we turn out to be is based on whether or not we can defeat that evil version of ourselves. And so it was basically like Grant Morrison talking about, like, the inner struggle of people, you know, the good versus the bad and that kind of thing. Uh, that led into the, the the birth of Cassandra Nova, who's basically, like, Xavier's evil counterpart. And ultimately, Xavier ended up, like, defeating the essence of Cassandra Nova, but Nova herself didn't really have a physical form. She was more of, like, an ideology. And so because of that, she copied the Xavier or copied the DNA of Xavier and gave herself a physical form, which is where she began to gestate in the womb of Sharon Xavier, the mother of Charles. When that happened, Xavier kind of quote unquote sensed her presence, destroyed her, and then she was kind of this disembodied form that sort of went out there and then eventually reformed herself and then came, you know, showed up as like a villain in the main Marvel universe. But again, it's tied into the, the nature of Grant Morrison's storytelling, which largely never makes sense to anyone but Grant Morrison himself. It's kind of a weird thing, but that's the nature of her. Think of her as like an evil female, uh, female version of Xavier with all the powers of Xavier. That's really kind of how she functions. But again, her showing up here, you know, kind of feedback into the first video, her showing up here is for the purpose of just kind of like seeding chaos and war and hatred. And, and really, it's not something she's creating, it's something that's already there. Is that it was only ever a matter of time before something like this happened. And so again, there's some character building that goes on here, explicitly with the character of Gentle. Now again, Gentle's character, he's being really created by, by Tom Taylor, and he's very incredible Hulk-esque. And that's one of the things that's important here, is with regards to, and this is something I want to address here for a second too, because I, I saw this question, people didn't fully understand what like X-Men Black was. With regards to what's going on right now in Marvel Comics, at the, at the time this video is being made, Marvel's kind of rebuilding the X-Men, right? Like Secret Wars 2015 happens, we go into the aftermath, we get all new, all different Marvel, and Marvel tries to push the Inhumans like anybody cares, and no one does. And uh, and, and they kind of make the X-Men take a back seat by just writing, you know, having stories that are written that are okay, but don't really like shine the X-Men in the best light. And what this does is it led to a lot of people hating the Inhumans even more because they suck and you should hate them, and, and getting angry about the fact that like the X-Men aren't, you know, aren't popular. And so in the aftermath of that, Marvel said, okay, fine, let's give people what they want because, you know, we're a publishing house. We exist to sell books. I don't know why you would do anything other than that, but let's give people what they want. Let's, let's basically start reforming the X-Men and, and making them into the team that everybody knows. And this comes in several different forms. Phoenix Resurrection, the return of Jean Grey. That goes into X-Men Red, but it also sees the launch of X-Men Black. And X-Men Black is basically just saying like, hey, here's, here's stories, like one-shot stories based on characters that you know to kind of give you an idea of who they are. So for people who are longtime X-Men fans, it's a return to familiarity. For people who are new to X-Men, it's giving us the stories about the characters that we know and the way they're supposed to be written. So that's it's really kind of like setting things to rights is really the purpose that serves. But for Gentle, he's basically the Incredible Hulk. He has the ability to like charge up his power and become like almost infinitely strong. The issue with this is that for reasons that were never originally explained, uh, he basically had these kind of mental blocks and he would experience physical pain. And this is explained here when we end up learning that like his mother was very abusive, that every time his powers would manifest, she would tear him down. She would physically attack 
attack him, different things like that. And so it's psychological and mental blocks in place. And what this means, this is kind of Tom Taylor's way of saying his cap at strength level is not anything that's limited. Uh, it's not an actual limitation. Instead, it's a limitation he put in place. So it's these little things that kind of go into building these characters up. And so from here, it picks up with the X-Men launching an attempt to basically hijack a plane over international waters and steal from a dead person. <laughs> that's basically what it is here. Now remember, all of this stems from, from Ambassador Mar uh, Marbury, you know, who, who had basically been killed by Cassandra Nova, but the way it had been recorded is it looked like Jean Grey had killed her. And so what Jean Grey intends to do is basically like take the phone, take the phone that belonged to Ambassador Marbury and then draw the audio off of it and then broadcast that audio to the world and show people how the conversation truly happened. But again, you know, using Trinary, her ability to tap into machinery, they basically take the giant Sentinel, they fly over to the plane, and then of course they turn around and enter it. Now this is one thing to bear in mind. With all these little, you know, Sentinel nanites that are in the in the brains of almost the entire world's population, Cassandra Nova's tapping into it at the same time. And so what she's basically doing is, is uh, essentially like making people aware of where the X-Men are. And then because of the nanites, they're in turn turning on the X-Men and attacking them. So there's really like no safe haven. Now, while all that's happening, Jean Grey's also kind of speaking directly with Cassandra Nova. And this is an important thing because what Cassandra Nova says is you can try this all you want to. You can try to speak truth to, to all this hatred and fear, but no one's going to care because in times of fear and desperation, people will believe what they want to believe. And people are afraid of the X-Men. In this day and age, people choose the facts they want. They come up with a, with an opinion. They come up with what they believe to be right and then search for information to verify the fact that they're right. They don't look at all the information and then come to a conclusion. They come to a conclusion and then search for information to verify it. And so because that's the way people are, you're not going to be able to change their minds. You're not going to be able to like talk reason into them because they don't want to hear reason. They want to hear verification of their own beliefs. And so it's, it's actually pretty smart of Cassandra Nova to pick that up because it's 100% and absolutely true. The other half of this is that where Jean Grey is kind of analyzing the mind of Cassandra Nova while she's talking to her, Cassandra doesn't care. And the reason why is Cassandra Nova is basically invoking kid abomination. Now, Jamie Carlson was originally introduced in Superior Iron Man, and he was never really like a big deal. The idea behind Jamie Carlson was that he was like five years old. His mom, like he was sick one day. His mom took him to work. There was a gamma experiment that had gone wrong, and basically he was blasted with gamma radiation. Eight years later, when he was 13, his powers manifested. He kind of freaked out. And ultimately, like there was an explosion in the house that killed his mom. And that was it. He's basically like an angsty teenage kid who has the powers of, of abomination. I mean, power is almost on the same level as abomination. He's not as strong as Emil Blonsky, but he's he's still strong in his own right. The idea behind this, though, was that because he was kind of free floating for a while, no one ever really knew what to do with him. But the reason why Kid Abomination is here, though, is because he is so powerful. And so because of that, when Teen Abomination is sent in, he literally just starts like attacking Atlantis, where the, where the X-Men are residing, which sort of leads to like Gentle. It's kind of a moment for Gentle's character where he faces off against Kid Abomination. He's really the only one that can go toe to toe with him with physical strength. But the X-Men are also kind of playing a humanitarian role here, because if they keep on fighting, then eventually Kid Abomination will just drown because he's just kind of in a mindless, animalistic state. Now, while that's also going on, the other X-Men who were on this plane, literally like a firefight breaks out on the plane. And the X-Men bring it into it pretty fast because, I mean, you know, you're talking about like depressurizing and, uh, you know, a jetliner at 30,000 feet, bring the whole thing crashing down to the ground and kill everybody on board. But the X-Men basically stop it pretty quickly. The issue with this is that Trinary loses her connection to the Sentinel. And when that happens, of course, you know, crashes down on the plane. And of course, they rec rescue things pretty fast. I mean, there's not a whole lot doing here. Uh, the phone is, of course, basically captured, but that leads Jean Grey to, to kind of being unable to clear her name directly. You know, and so instead, what she ends up doing is, is like addressing the world. Now, in reality, this is actually kind of a good idea because what it does is it just leaves things up to how people will respond to it. Like when Jean Grey makes this broadcast and sends it out, she basically says like, you guys are being manipulated by a being named Cassandra Nova. And when this happens, it's not the X-Men taking a kind of holier than thou attitude, right? Like you guys are stupid. And so you've been manipulated. And so we are going to fight on your behalf. That's not really what Jean Grey is saying. And it's smart to say that because she approaches it more from like a diplomatic stance. We understand what's going on here. We'll fight on your behalf, even if you don't want us to, because there's a greater threat here than what you're facing, than, than what you recognize. Now, again, Cassandra Nova doesn't really care. It doesn't really matter to her that much. She's just kind of going with it and just saying, yeah, that's not my biggest concern. At the same time that happens, Jean Grey basically hones in on the location of Cassandra, which is in Genosha. And it's kind of ironic, Cassandra would take up residence in the place that she destroyed. But then this leads to like a full on assault by the X-Men. So literally Storm comes in, bringing like a 300 foot tall ocean wave and brings it in just like crashing down on Genosha proper. And then at the same time, like Trinary tries to like tap into all these little, 
these little nanites. Now, here's the thing. What you're talking about here is, is Trinary trying to perform the equivalent of a telepath tapping into all the minds of the world at once. It can be done, but only by the most powerful of beings. You know, Trinary doesn't have the power to pull it off. It would tear her brain apart. And so Jean Grey's response, it actually comes from uh, Gabby. You know, it comes from X-23's little sister twin, essentially. And the question is asked, why don't you just use Cerebro? And it's such a smart move because what Jean Grey does is she says, okay, so like we need a vector here. We need someone whose mind can handle this and we need someone who can who can basically control these devices at the, or shut all these devices down. And so what they do, it's a, it's a brilliant maneuver. What Jean Grey does is she serves as a bridge. You have Gabby who sits down at the uh, at Cerebro and puts the helmet on. And then you have Jean Grey who touches both of them. And what this does is it allows the power of Trinary, you know, the ability to tap into machinery to transfer through Jean Grey to Gabby, who in turn can shut all these machines down because Gabby can handle it. I mean, like her brain constantly heals itself. So it's not like she'll be over, she'll, she'll be overwhelmed and she'll be shut down. When Cassandra Nova realizes what's going on, that like all these little nanite devices are being shut down, then she sends in, uh, she basically sends in like her secret weapon, which turns out to be Rachel Summers. Now, this is a very, very big deal, but let's sidetrack here for a second. So explanation needs to happen here. So most all of you guys have, have heard of the story of Days of Future Past. So in Marvel Comics, uh, across the multiverse, Jean Grey and Cyclops, every child they have has been a male. It's basically been like Nate Grey. Rachel Summers is the only female child of Jean Grey and Cyclops. In the Days of Future Past reality, Rachel Summers was one of the many people who was interned in these concentration camps that were created by the Sentinels, you know, humans and mutants, when they were all taken over. You know, when the Sentinels took over North America, when they became autonomous and conquered everything, she was one of many people who were interred there. Now, the way the original story played out is you end up having Rachel Grey, who sent the mind of Kitty Pride into the, into the past to stop Days of Future Past from happening. The problem is that because Days of Future Past was the future of the main Marvel Universe, when the events that caused that reality stopped, the Days of Future Past became an alternate universe. And so for Rachel Summers, nothing changed, and she didn't understand why. And so she ended up jumping back to the modern day in a story called Days of Future Present, basically skipped from her reality into the main Marvel Universe, and she'd been here ever since. But how she stands now, she's painfully depowered in comparison to how she used to be. But her facing off against Jean is a pretty significant thing, because this is a battle of, of some of the most powerful telepaths in existence. And so what goes on here is that you have Rachel Summers, who's totally dominated by Cassandra Nova, you've got Jean Grey facing off against her own daughter, and the fight's pretty severe. And so ultimately, because this would lead to Rachel's death, when Cassandra says, fine, you know, if Rachel's fighting back against me and she won't kill you, then I'll just kill her instead. Jean Grey stops Cassandra and hands herself over and says, fine, take me instead, like spare my daughter. And this is kind of a cool thing because in reality, Jean and, and Rachel didn't initially get along when they first met. You know, it was kind of a weird situation because Rachel Summers popped up after Jean Grey had died and then returned. Some bonding took place as time went on, but it is the daughter of Jean, even if from a different reality. And so this is like a parent fighting for the survival of their child. And so it's, 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 it's a pretty cool moment here. You know, when Rachel's freed, in turn, this, you know, leads to Rachel kind of freaking out, you know, and attacking Cassandra, so on and so forth. And where Cassandra goes to kill her, Jean Grey says, no, stop, Rachel, leave. Like, like, get out of here, you know, go be safe, do whatever you want to do. And in response, Cassandra Nova kills Jean Grey. And that's exactly what we would expect. It makes the most sense. If Jean Grey is like the only real formidable telepath who could stand against Cassandra Nova, because like Emma Frost couldn't do it. So if like Jean Grey is the only real, you know, formidable telepath who could stand against Cassandra Nova and literally lets her guard down, then why not destroy her? Now, in truth, it's kind of a MacGuffin because we end up finding out Jean Grey was never there in the first place. And it's kind of cool to see. It's kind of a cool moment, you know, to, to have this happen, but it probably could have been handled a little bit better, <laughs> to be honest with you guys. And so using Cerebro to, to essentially like trick Cassandra Nova, the idea is like, we're all coming for you. And so from here, suddenly things switch up. And this shows how intelligent Cassandra Nova is. On the island of Genosha, what ends up happening here is this broadcast is sent out to the world with Jean Grey basically saying like, I withdraw draw my invitation to unite with humanity. I withdraw my invitation to help you guys. We are basically creating a safe haven on Genosha. Any of you guys who come here, we will kill you. We will wipe out the entirety of humanity if we need to. It's suddenly like this really dark militaristic stance. And the reason why is because this is not Jean Grey. This is actually a artificial intelligence message that's basically a duplicate of Jean Grey that was created by Cassandra Nova. And that is genius. Because again, Cassandra Nova knows if people are walking this knife's edge, if, if the average human is walking a knife's edge and, and on one side, is absolute fear and on the other side is hope they will fall to the side of fear they always have when it comes to mutants and so with cassandra nova knowing that she pulls it off it's actually a pretty smart move and so in response to this Jean gray does the only thing she can do when she's given a prompt by gabby the idea is if we're facing off against a telepath of such incredible power Jean gray does not have the ability 
surgery to shield the minds of the world. And even if she did, you're talking about robotic implants in people's minds. So there's really no way to overcome that. I mean, a lot of them have kind of been kind of been destroyed, but those are the ones that are free floating out there. And so in turn, then, then the question becomes, how do you take them out? Like, how do you destroy a telepath of such a high level of power? Keeping humanity out of the picture, keeping humanity from acting is, is a big thing because here's, here's the way the situation would play out. What would happen here is Jean Grey and the X-Men would lead an attack on Genosha against Cassandra Nova. But Cassandra Nova would make this look like the X-Men, like, like there's basically a war of mutants breaking out. And if there was a war of like a basically a mutant civil war that happened on the planet, it could destroy the world. And so humanity would respond. And humanity would either jumpstart the Sentinel program or they would nuke Genosha and kill everyone there. And so because of that, this could lead to the potential annihilation of the entirety of the mutant population. Not only that, Jean Grey also knows if they launch a full-on strike because of how powerful Cassandra Nova is, that she would basically take over the minds of everyone. And so in, in, that, in that moment, she kind of says, okay, then let's make a phone call. And she contacts Tony Stark. Now, this is kind of cool because with the X-Men, this is one of the things to bear in mind. It's, it's kind of one of those returns the, to familiarity with the X-Men. When it came to the X-Men population, the mutant population in Marvel Comics and the X-Men teams, it was largely like we deal with things in-house. Like we don't really reach out to the Avengers to help us deal with things. We keep it all in-house. We don't really deal with like other people out there. Now, a lot of that was because of like the house that Chris Claremont built and the fact that the way the X-Men were done back then is it was usually focused almost explicitly on the X-Men themselves with very little crossover among other teams. Teams. And so because of that, when Jean Grey reaches out to Tony Stark, she basically says, like, we need your help on something. And Tony Stark says, well, I had to dump a ton of money into pulling this off, into to building these things, but I think I can help you guys out with this. And so when Jean shows up to Genosha, they show up prepared for battle. And it's a pretty cool moment here because what she says is, we were prepared for the fact that you would use your telepathic powers against us. And as powerful as I am, if I'm fighting, I can't protect everyone at the same time. And I'm the only real telepath here who can go toe to toe against you. And so what she ends up doing is she basically pulls out a helmet of Magneto, which is freaking amazing. She's like, I never agree with anything Magneto did. The guy was too militaristic. The guy was too extreme. But the one great idea he had is that he had a helmet that would block telepathic invasion. And then you find out that the X-Men have Magneto helmets. And then you find out that Name of the Submariner and all the Atlanteans have Magneto helmets. And then the Avengers show up and all the Avengers have Magneto helmets. It's awesome. Like this is what Tony Stark built. Magneto helmets for everyone. And it is badass so literally <laughs> so literally Jean Grey is just like this is war it is the X-Men the Avengers and the Atlanteans facing off against really the most dangerous mutant threat the X-Men have faced in quite some time it's pretty awesome but with that being said guys we're gonna bring this video to an end <laughs> if you are new here to comments explain make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. if you guys enjoy this video make sure you drop a like and yeah I will catch you all later peace